Hello Grand Rapids and all of YouTube. My name is Jeremiah Bannister and I'm your host of Paleo Radio and I've got the other host of Paleo Radio. It's a dynamic duo here today, my friend. We've got Joe Elder. What's going on, man? Hey, not much. How are you doing today? Dude, I'm doing awesome, man. We uh we started really late this time. Yes, we did. <laughs> Dude, like, it's so funny. We were like, oh, yeah, we'll do it at 10. And then we're like, well, 11 might sound better. And then today we, we pushed it even later. And we're just – uh, I'm really grateful, dude, that, that the people who enjoy the show uh, enjoy it in spite of that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I am they're, too. They're forgiving. They're forgiving people. Um, but we had a busy weekend. We had a whole bunch of stuff going on. Actually, you were out of town. Yes, I was. I, I went home for the weekend. Your went family, home. man. Yeah, your family oh, yeah. guy. Yeah. yeah, you went hunting. What what did you what did you hunt? Uh, we went hunting for coyotes. Did you get any? No, we didn't. No. Oh, no. Did you did, oh, you, shucks, did right? you see any though? Uh, we saw a few across the across the way, and we heard a few, but they were too far away. That's awesome though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so you had a fun time up north in in your, at your home and everything. Yeah, I had a busy weekend too. I uh, I'm wearing a button that I received from a, a young girl. She was celebrating her birthday at the rink and. Had a whole bunch of stuff. Amazing, amazing, fun time. We have a whole bunch of great stuff for everyone today. We uh, we were going through the show notes before the show, and we we're talking about some topics. And it was a really tough one. It's always tough uh, with the time limit like we have. And so we decided we wanted to talk about uh, the eighth grader who stumped the Christian apologist. We want to talk about Kevin Sorbo. Uh, that's that's big news. He's always in the news now. I mean, he's like a staple on uh, the Blaze and. <laughs> Especially the Blaze. I mean, he's just always there. They love him, man. They love him. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about ISIS and their their uh, goal, apparently, to fly a, an ISIS flag over the Vatican. And then we want to end on, on a serious discussion about Ebola. And I think that's going to be a lot of fun because while Joe and I uh, share uh, positions on a lot of this, we also have a little bit of a disagreement on it. Um, but neither of us are necessarily too settled in where we are. And so it's going to be a really cool exercise in, in thinking out loud. But okay, the eighth grader, bro. Did yes. he blow your mind or what? Yes, he did. He, well, boy, he had a nice articulated uh, set of notes, didn't he? He did. <laughs> His dad's a counter-apologist, I guess. I, I looked it up. For people who don't know, uh, I encourage you, go check out the friendly atheist, uh, uh, Hamat Mehta. And... He has a piece about this, about this uh, eighth grader who, who took on a Christian apologist, asked him a question, and he's got a video. You can watch the video of the interaction back and forth and kind of judge for yourselves on, on how well the eighth grader did and how well the Christian did in response to it. But, dude, this wasn't the first time that this, that this boy has done this. In fact, the uh, Meta talks about a time when he was in sixth grade and he confronted a creationist Eric Hovind and uh, just baffled him on that one. He, actually, I think he, he confronted Hovind on two separate occasions, if I remember correctly. Uh, he confronted him one time on creationism and one time, I don't know if it was about creationism or presuppositionalism, but either way, it was a deep, a deep subject, and the kid did great. And, and then another time uh, was a debate between his uh, uh, philosopher Phil Smith and Pastor Nathan Lewis. Um, and so or is between his father and, and Pastor Nathan Lewis. Okay, anyway. There's been numerous different people. That's the point. There's been numerous different people that this young guy has, has challenged. And this one struck a chord with both of us because it's something that we've talked about a great deal. Um, and it had to do with heaven, right? It had to do with who gets there. Now, that's the first thing. Like, like, what about the people who don't know, right? That kind of a question. But he was more specific than that, right? Because... Uh, he talked about uh, prison camps and stuff like this. Really interesting. He talked about uh, kids who who die of miscarriages. You know what happens to them, and and that led to the counter apologist bringing up an extra point, and this is one we talk about as well, having to do with heaven and what's heaven going to be like for the miscarried baby. You know, is the baby going to be thirty? Uh, are we going to be able to recognize him or her? But it was a really really interesting back and forth in exchange with his eighth grade. Yeah, it was, and he, you could tell there was an articulated set of points that he was trying to lead him into a direction of the unknown, like how, how do you defend the unknown? A lot of the uh, apologist statements started with, well, you know, 
I think in heaven it could be like, which which that's the exact reason why he argued the way he did. Our, our young eighth grade friend Chad did was because it's it puts you in a very logically hard position to argue about things that you simply can't know about, which is things about death and claims about things that happen after you die. So he was simply going after just the basic fundamental ideas of of how do you know what really happens to things after they die, and based on what we know here on Earth. What are certain? There's certain gaps in the theory of spreading the word of God to everybody that people don't consider. And Chad was able to bring a few of those up. Like, what if you're a starving kid in isolated North Korea in a in a work camp that won't have any access to such things? What does God do about that? You know, or right. uh, miscarried babies. He found these right. these holes in the in the theory of just spreading God's word. Right. You know, there's a, it's an age-old question, you know, what, what do you do of the people who don't know? And uh, what makes it so interesting, I think, is that for being such an old question, uh, religious people have never done really good about establishing a, a real satisfactory answer to it. And I guess what really stands out um, to me in that discussion was, were two things uh, that, the, that the Christian guy said uh, that go into kind of this old question. Um, one of those was nature, and that nature is sufficient in many ways to, to lead somebody to the idea uh, that God exists, you know, and that sounds like an interesting thing, but when they talk about that, they're not just saying some general deistic God, or maybe it's a she or a he, uh, they believe in a trinity, most of them do, most self-identifying Christians believe in a trinity, and that that is God, and I don't, I've never really heard how uh, from nature that we can really conclude anything close to the Trinitarian God as it's formulated in classical Trinitarian theology. Like I just never... Oh, no. Uh, yeah, no. I've never said that. And the second one, other than nature, um, what, what, was, what was the second one? He just said, didn't he, j or, did he just... Well, there must just be a good reason. Creation, you're saying he said nature, like just where he said creation is the answer? Well, he says that, that that's one of his answers to that, right, is mm -hmm. that well, the created order of things. And the other one uh, was that God is perfectly just, therefore there has to be an explanation even if I don't understand it. Yeah, well, and I think he started a few of his uh, retorts with, well, somehow, I think, which that's yeah. that always puts you into hot ground. Yeah, somehow, right? And what about it, the probability statement, too? I didn't mean to cut you off, but no, yeah, I'll, no, I'll just throw fine. that in there, too. A Absolutely. Prob the probability. So number one was nature. Right? Number two was justice. Yes. Uh, and, and number three was uh, was what we just said here just a second ago here. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't recall the no, third No, it's okay. One. It's all right. Yeah. So we're, we're trying to tackle a whole bunch of these things. But he, but <laughs> well, he just kind well, of... The other thing, too, is he, he kind of led him in circles. I mean, he absolutely did. It's hard. It's it's really hard to even organize what the apologist said because he was, he was being torn apart in three or four different places at once. But... What you were talking about with probability, I think that's a big right. one. That, that's what it was. The, the third one had to do with probability. So there's there is yes. the, uh, there's the brain fart. So nature and, and the probability, justice, was, probability yeah. those three They things. were using yeah. miscarriages as probability where he said, well, what is it, 75%? Are, there's miscarriages. Yeah, 70%, yeah, 70% natural miscarriage rate. Right? So it, by that, by probability standards, we're saying that there's a vast more, a vast bigger majority of those individuals in heaven than there would be anybody else. <laughs> and and a lot of people don't want to argue, they don't want to think these things through because they just want to have it, they answered like the apologists did. Well, somehow they have a way of communicating and making making themselves known in heaven. Well, that's, that's a very interesting theory, I would have to say. But I, I think about probability... Most people just have to have some sort of overarching view that there's an order to everything. But the truth is it's probability. Things happen for, for no other reasons other than mathematical probabilities that we experience. You know, think about the person who says, oh, there's a ghost in my house because I was in the kitchen and a pot fell. Well, do you take into consideration the amount of times you walk into your kitchen and a pot doesn't fall? Nothing happens in the kitchen? You're there millions of times in your lifetime, and the pot falls once, but then there's something there. It's these. It's just an irrational way of thinking. It's it's probability that leads our lives, and because there's no 
definite answer to it, I think, that scares people, but wouldn't they rather have the truth, I guess, is my question. Right, and he talked, there's something interesting about the probability thing. Um, that whole issue came up when talking about, you know, what happens to the miscarried children, and he, he pulled out that, well, you know, there's a good probability that those children are going to be going to heaven. And we just kind of chuckled at two things. Number one, how would you be able to determine to what degree that would be probable? Um, and, like, on what, what yeah. basis are you saying it's more probable than not, number one? Mm -hmm. And number two, if this is true, then what what is paradise actually going to look like? I mean, you would have at least – I mean, if every, if every born – adult, right, and every born person who wasn't miscarried naturally, um, if, if they all went to heaven, the ratio would be 70% babies, 30% yeah. adults in every other age. And if, do they grow up? And do they grow up? And if you whittle that down to what most Christians would say when they say, well, um, not many people are actually going to go to heaven. If you, look at, if you look at history as a big picture, the vast majority of people uh, who have lived are not part of the, the frozen chosen or the select few. So they're going to find themselves burning uh, forever in hell. And so let's say that even, let's say 10% of those people, you know, you're still, you're looking at that point that heaven is going to be overwhelmingly, almost entirely nothing but miscarried babies. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm not yeah. joking. Like that's... No, it would. <laughs> Mathematically, it would be. It would be so... It, it, the ratio would just be so bizarre uh, what what heaven would look like if in fact that that was true and that was the case um, but just the whole the whole conversation was was so interesting and to hear this guy and you could you tell just how riddled he was is how baffled he was all the like when he oh, heard yeah. it he kind of just he went into gospel mode and just kind of went through the whole Romans road. Uh, with that, and well, you need to remember sin, and yeah. you know, well, like stuff that had nothing to do really with the question that he had uh, laid out. But there's really not not much of a theological answer to any of that stuff. That's right. And as and as that kid, I mean, we had an eighth grader that drug him out into deep water and found out he couldn't swim. I mean, really, that's what happened. He he asked some questions where he had to give succinct answers, and all of the answers had to rely on. Somehow, I think maybe there could be. I believe it to be, but is that a rational way to look at things? No. Is that a rational way to live your life, or is that how you want to logically lay out the structure of the way you're going to look at your life? I I don't think so. And what what would be off the table if we accept that kind of reasoning as valid reasoning about the other no. side of the door? Uh, what would be off the table? Like, I mean, could any, at that point, could any individual truth claim by any believer be said to be, well, that's just nuts? I mean, or is it like, well, you're birds of a feather. <laughs> like, well, it's, like it's, how do you determine which, which, which bird to, to fly with on this score? Yeah. Well, it's very strange how human beings do that, too. We, we have such a blurred line with what we consider to be completely intolerable and what we consider to just be, yeah, it's a religious belief. Because... Logically, there's people that will make claims on things that just simply aren't true, and we know they aren't true, and we can dismiss them without a without a second guess. But yeah. somehow, when we involve we invoke a celestial appeal to authority, all of a sudden these crazy claims become justified, and they stay in the town square longer than they should. I think, you know, ridicule is a good thing in some cases. Uh, we need to be able to say, "Oh no, that's a terrible idea. It needs to be cast out." And and you <laughs> believe it came from a deity. We need to exercise that stuff. You know, it it reminds me of that whole discussion I had. The I think it was the first episode. It was the one the one you weren't on, uh, and it was about the ghosts, right? Mm. And, and the claims made by the woman. I wish I remember her name. The woman that was featured in this news spot in Pennsylvania about the haunting of her house, right? Alleged haunting. And the kind of claims she was making about reality and, and what was really going on, that's not just a ghost, it's a demon. And mm -hmm. it's not just a demon, it's trying to shut you up because you're trying to get the story out there. Yes. That's not just a weird feeling, that's an actual scratch from a, from a, a celestial being, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, all of these claims and how they were accepted just at face value by the, by the reporter, 
And it's kind of the same thing here. What, at what point, right, what claim can we look at and just say, you know what, that's just Looney Tunes. That's just bizarro world. And I, and I don't believe that. Um, and what do you do in situations where uh, ridiculous beliefs are given a ridiculous amount of respect, like in, in a society, and say, <laughs> what do you do, right, to say, let's, mm -hmm. let's level this field and say, if we're saying that about the voodoo doctor over here uh, with his chicken bones and urine, uh, what yeah. are we going to say about the person over here with a scapular or with holy water or blessed mm -hmm. oil or whatever? What do we say of that that magician too? And uh, mm -hmm. I think, well, like you said, I think ridicule is maybe a great place to start. And I I don't think that ridicule I don't think that ridicule necessarily has to be nasty or mean spirited or done out of ill will. I think that I think that ridiculous ideas, by definition, are worthy of ridicule. I I think that's about it. Definitionally speaking, it's yes. worthy of it, right? I mean, it's not to intimidate anybody, but yes, there is such a thing as a dumb answer, and yes, there are such things as dumb ideas. And sometimes, I'm not saying you need. It's not that we cast out. And we don't discuss these ideas, but I mean, we see monotheistic cultures clash all the time over over their deeply held belief systems that are usually irrational in a lot of cases. And it seems like the two irrational beings come to a head with each other more than they do with the logical world. Mm -hmm. Speaking of dumb ideas, dude, what's the uh, what's the news there with old uh, Hercules? Oh yeah, we got Mister Mister Sorbo is Mister Kevin Sorbo, dude. Here. Speaking of dumb ideas, right? Oh, mm -hmm. absolutely. I, I'm getting the page up right now on my computer, but uh, Kevin Sorbo's a little upset about uh, how there's persecution in Hollywood with Christians. Yes, and how you know he didn't have any success with uh, God's Not Dead. We all know that he he didn't make any money on that. So there's a lot of persecution in Hollywood of Christians. Yeah, but right. Because, is, uh, yeah, because he never, he didn't make any money on God's Not Dead. Right. Right. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah, I was gonna say they they're very they're very anti uh, Christian in their belief. I'm sure. Um, this is by uh, Michael W. Chapman. This is from CNS News, and it says uh, Hercules actor. In quotes, being a Christian in Hollywood, you get attacked. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm just going to go down to kind of the the bread, the the meat and potatoes of the whole entire thing. But he he was having an interview, um, and he was telling uh, them basically about what it's like to be a Christian in Hollywood. And Sorbo had said, "I think being a conservative in Hollywood and being a Christian in Hollywood, you get attacked. Mm -hmm. It's so strange to me that the media sits there and protects the things that they protect." Or they ignore the things that they ignore, and they go after stories like global warming. Like it's, it's more quotes. important than what's going on in the world right now with these terrorists. <laughs> so basically he's saying, hey, this whole warning about people dying later, people are dying now, kind of. I, I guess logically I get it, but... I Backwards, very backwards way of thinking, Mr. Sorbo. And... Do do Christians in Hollywood seriously get persecuted? I mean, is that a word that they're capable of using to describe the atmosphere around them? Because we know there are certain situations where persecution means a lot more. Right. And it must be the only reason why his career didn't take off, because he's been such a devout Christian for so long. Yeah. At least since the making of Pool Boy. That, and Pool that, Boy 2, yeah. Pool Boy 2, the sequel to the uh, movie that ne never happened. Right. Everyone, please check out Pool Boy. Let Kevin Sorbo know it's his best film. I think the worst thing about Kevin... It's not the worst thing, but the worst case for Kevin Sorbo is that his very best work is not filmed. Or not many people know his very best work, which is indeed Pool Boy 2. Pool Boy, right. And for people who don't know... Okay, and I let me say this first, man. I, I've been following this guy. I looked him up as you were talking. Bob Dudko. Bob Dudko, I think it's like uh, top ten proofs or something like that. dot com. He's a Christian apologist of some kind. He has a uh, a program, um, but he was he he met Sorbo, and he was talking about Sorbo from God's Not Dead. Uh, like the article here, Michael Chapman, he mentions uh, Soul Surfer, right? The the movie about the girl who the surfer who had the shark attack, lost her, believe her left mm -hmm. arm in the shark attack, and he was in that. It was an inspirational movie. So they mentioned that, and interestingly enough, that movie, The uh, Soul Surfer, that one happened before he did, uh, in the same year, but before, uh, um, 
Pool Boy 2. And the best Pool movie Boy, made. And so I, I posted on Bob Dutko's Facebook page, and I said in the comment section, because he had all these people who were like, oh, Sorbo's an amazing Christian. Oh, Sorbo's just so <laughs> – he's a, he's a real inspirational character, and we need more people like him. And, and yeah. they're all mentioning – Stuff that he'd been in. They they mentioned Hercules. They mentioned mm -hmm. the Soul Surfer. They mentioned God's Not Dead. They mentioned the movie that's coming out, Let the Lion Roar, in which apparently he plays John Calvin, the 16th century Protestant the theologian, uh, John Calvin. They mention all those things, and they completely to, forget to mention Pool Boy Two, and Pool Boy Two is is borderline pornographic, right? He ha he has. It, it, the insinuation is that he has sex with the wife that he just tried to bring back to life after she was drowned by a Mexican gang no. guy. Yeah, and it's a comedy. I mean, it's a comedy. It's a, comedy, it's, a, yes. it's, a right. it's a farce. It's a farce type comedy. But oh yeah, him driving right. with the arm buckled into the seat next to him in a in a pool van. That sort of comedy. Yeah. Right. The, the old uh, Lord forgive me for what I'm about to do. You know that kind of thing. And and borderline and blasphemous. I mean, it was not even borderline. I mean, like, I don't know any Christian, conservative Christian, who likes Sorbo and who likes Bob Dudko. I don't know a single one of those people in that thread. Number one, that saw it. Number two, that if they did, they would sit through the entire thing and be like, you know, Kevin Sorbo. Yeah, he's a real inspirational Christian character in Hollywood. There's a talent. There's a talent. You know? Yeah. No. No. Not at all. Like. Yeah. So. So I, I posted there, and I said I would post a link, but I think it would offend the sensibilities of most of your your readers. Nobody responded to that. A whole bunch, like you, you have all of these single line comments, and then you have this chunk of a comment that's mine talking about Pool Boy Two. Dude, nobody touched it. Nobody got near it. Oh yeah, they they forgot about it. They're like, oh, no, I don't know about that thing. Don't you find it odd that people didn't think it's blasphemous that he pretended to be a different Greek god? Or do you think it's because people go, oh, well, Greek gods, those are obviously fake. <laughs> right, right. And not even understanding uh, par arguably uh, parallels between the Jesus myths uh, and Hercules. And, Hercu and myths surrounding Hercules. Like, <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it's really strange. I think, and it would be hard. I mean, sure, Hercules was kind of family-oriented, but, dude, it was definitely an adult program, too. Oh sure. You know the idea that it was like a Christian program or anything like that is just, it's just not how, even realistic. How I mean, can you have a Greek god be a Christian program? Right. Well, they did it. <laughs> they did it once. They had a their Christmas episode. Uh, it, one of their Christmas episodes, man. It was just so funny. They they threw in the whole Jesus thing. Yes, I, I, my wife's in the other room. I wish she could possibly maybe she could hear me talking about it, but. Um, they were talking about how you know the real meaning. It was a there's there was a story from a long time ago. In fact, I thought that they were at. No, there's no way that they were at the nativity scene. Right? There's, they might, so there's, dude. I right, right. have to look it up because they very right? they very well might be at the. Nativity. <laughs> yeah, Hercules looking from afar, you know. But um, but yeah, I mean, Hercules you know. and Mithra and Odin were all there. Yeah, so those are the wise men. Do people just didn't know it? Kevin Sorbo was one of the wise men. You know. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That but, would be that'd be intense. You know, the whole thing gets me though. Um, whenever I hear stuff about this, and not just Sorbo, forget Sorbo for a second. This mantra that you hear from from American Christians that they endure persecution, it it offends me. Like it it really like it doesn't not so much offends me. It just upsets me. It's like you know. Get over it. Get you know. Get real. Get real. Well, how can you be a persecuted majority in terms of that's not an apartheid like we were, you were said that before? But how can you have a persecuted majority? Apartheid. The majority of people right. are religious, predominantly Christian in the United States. Still, how can you be persecuted? You are the majority. Your your will is being done. You know. I mean. It's it's one of it's one thing to consider another nation where Christianity is a is a minority sect, but those same forms of argument you can rationally use with any form of minority in a different sect. It's the question of being in America in a first world country, where you say I'm a persecuted Christian, and I'm just as persecuted as somebody else when you're in the majority of people. Right. It's simply incorrect. And it can't I I cannot find an example 
where that is true, where you're an absolute, you're an absolute persecuted majority that has the sway that Christianity has in our country. You can't run for office hardly. In fact, I mean, there was what one out in the open atheist in Congress, and he lost his reelection bid. Yes. I mean, like, I mean, you just—it's—it's it's not realistic at all. Like, I don't—I don't believe that Barack Obama was a Christian. I really don't even necessarily believe that Bill Clinton was a Christian. But I don't believe he was any more of a Christian or less of a Christian than George Washington was, or any of the, most sure. of the founding fathers, for that matter. Mm -hmm. But the idea that persecution is this, you know, real thing in the daily lives of, of most Christian people in the United States. It's, it's absurd. I pass by. We live in, in Jerusalem, right? We live in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Grand mm -hmm. Rapids, I went to, it was like churchfinder.org or something, you know. Loaded. Um, lo dude, we're, we're talking just on that site alone. It was like one church for every, like, less than 500 people in the city. It was like for every 300 there was a church, something like that. And that was just on that, that website. And that had uh, at least, and I, I listed out a, a number of the denominations that weren't listed on there that I know for a fact have churches in this area. And I said, you know, the, and none of them, I don't know a single one of them, that, that tell their parishioners, you might want to park your car a ways away from the church and, and dress up with a fake mustache and some glasses because the cops are looking for you. Or right. the, the, the bad guys are just all going to come in and get you. I mean, it's just well, it's so, radic it's so radically unbelievable. And they'll use Nick of something happened to some to a Christian in a minority situation like over in the Middle East and they'll compare that to something like the war on Christmas right where they'll say that's somehow similar right and that's not similar <laughs> no that's well, not yeah. even close. right because you've got the, the so-called war on Christmas right or the war on Easter you know or war on St. Patrick's Day parade um, you've got that kind of thing, but then you've got real persecution. This, I guess, is where it bothers me because we live in a world where people really are persecuted for their beliefs in, in different places, uh, around different places around the world. And Christians right now are a persecuted minority in Iraq, just just throwing that one out there. Or in the Middle East, they're, they're a persecuted minority in many places. Um, there was, a, there was a, uh, an article, The Gospel Herald, and my, my cousin Dustin I saw this on his on his wall on Facebook, and I checked it out. ISIS names Christians as number one enemy as persecution escalates in the Middle East. And apparently, uh, ISIS they have a, a, a propaganda booklet, right, called Dabiq, if I'm pronouncing it right. I believe um, so. Yeah, Dabiq. Right. Yeah, D A B I Q. And according to Arutz Sheva, the cover photo on the booklet is a photoshopped picture of the Vatican bearing the ISIS flag. Within the literature, the terror group reveals their desire to conquer Rome, defeat Christianity, and, quote, break the cross. Mm -hmm. Right? And so, and, and, and Christians living over there are literally fleeing for their lives. Right? They are literally shaking in their boots, dude. Like, the, the prospect that, that these barbarians are at the gates, the reality that they're at the gates is a terrifying thing. Those Christians over in those countries have to look at their children and, and try to reassure them in any way possible that they're going to do their best to be safe uh, and try to tell them what happens if we're not and answer those questions to their children. What happens if ISIS shows up? What happens if they come to the door, Daddy, and they shoot you? What happens with this? That is real religious persecution. That's real. That's tangible and real. So when people like Sorbo get up there and say, well, in Hollywood, it, especially in a year like we, we've had here, the last year or two years, how many major Christian movies have been on the silver screen with yeah. packed out audiences of people, tons of people. When I went to God's Not Dead, uh, I went, I tried going with Ed Brayton of Free Thought Blogs and a couple friends from CFI, and I, I get in there, and I thought on a Thursday, I think it was a Thursday we went, I thought, it's a Thursday, it's been out for weeks, Nobody's going to be in the building. Dude, I couldn't have been more wrong. Yeah. That, that, that theater was packed to the brim with people. We had, there was hardly, I don't know, I don't even know if there was any, there wasn't any open seats because I got the last ticket. My friend and I, we got the last tickets. Um, and, and you look at that and you say, so you're, you're raking in the loot. 
you're you're going on shows right with with Newsmax or Fox News or any of the other major shows, and you're saying you're a Christian, and and what's happening to you, right? What's happening to all your Christian friends? What's happening to the churches all around? Are they experiencing anything remotely close to what Christians who are in in countries overseas who are really honestly being persecuted? Are, are, are Christians here experiencing anything like that? And the answer is no. no. It's a definitive, no way in hell, not never. Um, and it's it just, it upsets me. I'm visibly offended. No. Well, and the other thing about persecution is the most persecuted religion, and I'm probably going to get guff for it, but I'll say it anyways. Say the it. most religious, per, the most religiously persecuted group in the world are Muslims. People of the Islamic faith. Mm -hmm. Those are people who are ostracized and othered not only by their immediate social standards, but by countries outside of their own and nations outside of theirs that deem them a certain way based on their religious beliefs as well. And the the bloodshed is the bloodshed is clear. I mean, you want to talk about persecution like we were talking about before the show. Be in Pakistan on a clear day and worry about a drone strike when you walk into school. And yeah, that's not just day. because there's bad people in Pakistan. Those people are being attacked because of religious belief. That's really it is religious persecution. And if we're funneling this amount of money into wars like that, are we really going to war against terrorists, or are we going to war against a religion and a faith? Mm -hmm. There was a there, there was a part of this piece with uh, at the Gospel Herald. Uh, what is it, Leah Clett? And she said something that just it just drove me up a wall. Um, she was saying this, and she's she's partially right, right? And then maybe that's what upset me the most. She said this, and I'll just quote her: "A little more than a decade ago, right? And maybe that's the key phrase there. A little more than a decade ago, 1.6 million Christians resided in in Iraq. Mosul, the nation's second largest city, was home to 60,000 Christians who practiced their religion in the midst of their Muslim neighbors. However," Over the past several months, and that's the, that's the kicker for me, that's what pisses me off. Over the past several months, ISIS has executed innumerable Christians throughout Iraq and Syria or forced them to flee the country in an, in an attempt to establish a caliphate uh, or Islamic state in the Middle East. There are no longer any Christians living in Mosul for the first time in 2,000 years, and the 100,000 remaining in the capital city of Baghdad live in constant fear for their lives as ISIS draws closer. That's so true and so wrong at the same time. I encourage our viewers, go back and try to find and, and look for articles that talk about Christian refugees as a result of our policies in Iraq and what Christianity was like under Saddam Hussein, what kinds of uh, freedom of movement and speaking that they had, um, of freedom of speech that they had under Saddam Hussein, and then look at how many fled because of what we unleashed in that area when we toppled Saddam Hussein. They were fleeing a long time ago. There were refugee cri crises uh, going almost a decade ago, which is right there, a little more than a decade ago. There's a lot that's happened in that decade, including a war, right, I including a war against Iraq that resulted in this kind of a thing. I spoke about it when I was on Paleo Radio on uh, WOCR. And I'll have it in Michigan. In fact, I, I maybe I'll uh, I'll find it. Maybe I can uh, share it along with these videos here, um, where I talk specifically about the the refugee problem and the people fleeing Iraq and how the Christian face of Iraq, how many Christians there were, how it was it was dramatically depleted well before ISIS was even a word a, a, a thought in the mind of of even the people in ISIS. Maybe I mean. Like this goes back a ways, and it just it 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 upset me because it was used by Leah Klett as an opportunity to try to paint it as though this is the reason for for the demise of Christians in Iraq, and that there was nothing really wrong before then. They enjoyed all this peace, and now uh, this is what's going on, and and was doing it to prop up the idea that we need to be more involved with with military intervention, and it just to me, I said that. I, I, I have very little respect for what Leah Klett did. Uh, I would have had a great deal of respect for her if she just simply stuck to <laughs> the story and, and wasn't, wasn't using it as, as a tool to prop up the idea of military intervention in Iraq and Syria.
Yes, and I think there's a general misconception in America that um, people in the Middle East don't believe that America is fighting as Christians, which they do. They when they see the U.S., they that is Christianity over their head. Right. That's not just the. They don't think, oh, just the U.S. Those are that. That is correlated with Christians, and Christians coming to kill us. And so, for the Christians that are on the ground in those areas, that becomes a very volatile and dangerous situation. So, our actions in the Middle East, just like you're saying, was the precursor to this mass exodus of Christians out of the Middle East because they were viewed as somewhat or cor it correlationally responsible for what we were doing in their skies and through drone strikes and bombing and uh, and basically plundering their cities. And they were seeing that as a Christian activity, not the United States, but the United States operating as a front for Christianity to attack them. And so that is why we saw the mass exodus, not just because of what's going on in the past few months. Right. And what and, and the whole idea of the, the propaganda booklet, Davik, okay, let's talk about this for a second. The idea, it says something, though, about ISIS, I guess, that, that they want to conquer Rome, defeat Christianity, and break the cross, right? But Rome's really uh, targeted for them, and I'm thinking, like, <laughs> how, how would that ever happen, right? I mean, it, it, it's, it's, so, it's so ridiculous, but it really gives an idea as to what ISIS thinks that they're fighting and what yeah. ISIS says that they're fighting and, and what the people they're trying to recruit what they're convinced of that we're fighting, right? Or that they're fighting. That they say, well, uh, we're fighting Christianity, that that's what this is. Um, and I think that as Americans, we often don't like to put ourselves in, in the shoes of another person. We, have a, a, we, we don't mind doing it with people as long as they're not too far out of our Overton window or not too far out of our geographic locale. But the moment that you start doing that to people in other countries, it's like, yeah, especially bad guys. You know, you don't you don't want to put yourselves in the in the shoes of a bad guy uh, and try to get where they're coming from and why they're why they're saying and doing the things that they're doing. But I, I think that it, it's awfully telling that to them that they use this, uh, that they use uh, Rome, Christianity, and breaking the cross. Whereas you know, let's say Al Qaeda in the, in the early days, at least Al Qaeda. Uh, was more interested in talking about a lot of things to do with uh, the Kyoto Agreement, right, mm -hmm. and and how uh, climate impacted Afghanistan and other regions, and the fact that we were in certain places in their holy cities, or that we uh, had, or that we were manipulating and being manipulated by uh, the Saudi royals and stuff like that, that that was their pitch, right, back then, and the pitch now is this, which says something, I think, about the people they're trying to pitch it to and the cultural conditions and the mental mindset of people who are, are in, in the Middle East and in, in, in countries that we are bombarding and what they perceive this entire thing to be. Yes. Well, and yeah, it's playing to the group. They know that there's a group of people that, well, it's, I don't want to be too stereotypical here in saying it, but it's not like there's a massive amount of higher education flooding through the Middle East right now in big systems. There, I'm not saying there are educated people there, but it, it shows a rudimentary level of ignorance that they think the Vatican is the source of Christianity. Kind of like capture the flag. Like, oh, if we get that and put the flag up, then everyone will just go home and call it quits. <laughs> like, it's just an irrational way of looking at the situation. And it's looking at it, it it's like a 2,000-year-old argument, so it seems like a 2,000-year-old way of solving it by going after something that was relevant 2,000 years ago. Or, And I know the Vatican was relevant earlier than that, but to say that the Vatican is somehow a, a pillar of Christianity that Christianity couldn't exist without, I, I disagree with that completely. It's kind of frustrating for me to feel like I... That, that my emotions and that my my thoughts and that my life is kind of caught up in this this whole thing and, and that it's it's very much a problem between two people having a pissing contest as to whose magic man is real yeah and and that that because of their seriousness and because of the amount of power they happen to have and the amount of danger that they can uh, the, the havoc that they can uh, put on humanity that we have to take this very seriously. Um, and that we're and and that we're left in a place where, on the one hand, you don't want to see anybody persecuted. On the other hand, 
you got ma magicians persecuting magicians over magical thinking, and that this yeah. is ultimately what what we're talking about. And it's really frustrating to me. There's there's part of me, and I know this is really crass, but there's part of me that just wants to simply say, listen, you get what you got. You if you want to jump in that war that, that didn't start yesterday, it's extremely old, and you want to get involved in this this war of the gods, uh, which God is real. Um, you're going to find yourself in this position, and no amount of military might has ever taken care of it in the past. No amount of military might is going to take care of it today, and we're all the worse off for it. And it 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 just it drives me nuts. Yeah, no, that's ex that's exactly right. What what are we going to do? How how do you how do you finish an argument with two monotheistic cultures? Obviously, there's a reason they're fighting each other because they both are laying claim to the same thing, both with the same amount of evidence. Zero evidence. But right. that's what they're doing. They, I mean, they're literally fighting each other over these monothe monotheistic tenets that they both have, and they want to say that my God is mine, your God is wrong, and I'm going to kill you for it. That, is, like you said, ancient argument. And you can't bomb ideas. Bullets don't kill ideas. But discourse does. And right. I think there's a way of logically fighting these things out of our system. And to arm up and re-engage is not the way to solve it. It just seems like a, it seems like energies that could be used doing much uh, more productive things uh, for society. Right. You know, I just the the entire debate, this entire thing, uh, is premised on the idea, really down to its root, in so many ways, on, on the idea that that our God's better than yours. And I. I can't help but to think, you know, you hear in, in, in America, you hear a lot of these people get on there, the more religious types, conservative religionists. Um, they'll, they'll get on TV and they'll talk about just nuking them sand niggers, right? Just, just yeah. nuke, nuke the towel heads. And they, they say this kind of nonsense, these offensive things. Um, and yet their, their, their uh, undergarments get all in a bunch when, when they hear somebody from a Muslim, another monotheist, an absolutist, a, a bird of a feather cut from the same cloth, saying something similar about nuking the Jews. Nah, yeah. Just get rid of them. Just nuke those bastards. Yeah, that's and, the way to they, solve it. Right, that's the way to solve it. And it seems like that's kind of where they're all coming from. <laughs> you know, yeah. it, it, Israel's, it, Israel's upset because we're not more militarily involved. We need to wipe these people out. Uh, people in the United States, we need to wipe these people out. People over... Uh, in, in Iraq and in Syria, the, the uh, jihadists, they wipe out the Jews, wipe out America, wipe out the Vatican. And this is their world. This is the way that their mind works. And it's not like it's a small group of them. These are people who are making gobs of money and have huge amounts of influence and power uh, politically and culturally that believe these things and that say these things and talk about these things. Uh, and not just here, but in Israel and and places uh, in the Middle East, and you just you shake your head and you say, "Is this really all that you have? Is this the answer that that uh, yeah. get rid of them all and then get mad when the other group says, "Well, we should nuke you." Well, no, we should nuke you, and and I can't well, believe you would talk about nuking. Nuke those people. It is a it's a giant dick measuring contest. It is. It is. It's a. It is. It's a. It's a. My gun's bigger than your gun is bigger than your gun is bigger than your gun is bigger than your gun. It's very rudimentary. It's very barbaric. It's very simple, and it's a and it's, it's a logical form of thinking that we need to just abandon. Right. So okay, moving on. Ebola. Yes. Okay, we were talking about this before the show, uh, and and we both read a couple articles on it. Um, and you know the, the question I guess has to do with containment. Right, and, and what is the best way for it to be contained? And there's arguments that you're hearing, uh, your, I, I would say your sensationalist arguments um, on the right that you have, let's say Fox News or Glenn Beck or Michael Savage or Alex Jones. These would be your sensational people on the right. And I think on the left, I think there's almost um, a lackadaisical approach, almost like, well, we can take care of anything that comes our way, and, and it sounds almost as, as convincing as the high school valedic, valedictorian assuring everybody in, in the school that, that they could have all been there. You know, every one of you could be up here. We're all the same and, and, and stuff, and this kind of utopian idealism that you hear in high school graduation ceremonies is kind of 
echoed uh, in what you hear about America's infrastructure, our, our ability to deal with this, our ability to contain uh, possible outbreaks and the like, and, and uh, premised upon more liberal Western values too, that, that our Western values are inclusive, that we aren't isolationists, and not just about military policy, but also foreign policy in general. Um, and, there, and, and then my personal belief is that there, there has to be a middle. There has to be a golden mean. There has to be, between these two thieves, there has to be a save, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what that answer is. I, I don't. I know, that, I know that I'm not convinced by the right or the left on this. I, I'm not too reassured by uh, President Barack Obama. I watched his White House address uh, talking about uh, Ebola, and I wasn't too reassured <laughs> by that. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't have the answer for it. You know, I, I, and I want your thoughts on this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my thoughts are if you have, and I'm not saying we have all the best physicians in the world and the best doctors, but we have quite a few of them. And if you have first world nations that are not responding to this Ebola outbreak at the source, which would be in third world nations like Sierra Leone and Liberia, are at risk of a backfire. It's, it's, it's blowback. They're at risk of a blowback because what could happen is the disease would fester and there's no clear, clean way of barricading a border for 350 million people from a disease. So the so it's, it's like you said, there is a middle ground. The idea that we can close up every border is nonsense. It's not going to work. It, it doesn't work. And uh, the uh, president of the CDC, what is it, uh, Tom Friedman? Yeah. Was it, I think, let me, let me check. This is from... Frieden. Frieden, yeah. This is uh, the insider for Fox News. And it says, uh, CDC Director Tom Frieden pushed back this morning against those who argue the United States should ban all flights from West Africa and not allow people into the country from places like Liberia. He had said in, in, in quotations here, I wish we could get to zero risk by sealing off the border, but we can't. The only way we are going to get zero risk in this country is by controlling it in Africa. Until that happens, Americans may come back with Ebola. Other people who have the right to return or a visa to enter may come back. People go to third world countries and come and come from there. Sealing off, first off, won't work. Second off, it will backfire because it, it can't get the help in there, and then we're not going to be able to stop the outbreak, and ultimately we will end up at higher risk, not lower risk. See, I just don't – That that's where I'm skeptical. I mean, why couldn't we still go in there? I mean, it's, it's one thing to say – um, shut something down coming in. It's a different thing saying going out. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there is there is there not some sensibility to the statement to say the United States, if we look at places like Sierra Leone, yeah, we're not really interested in having too many of you come here right now, but if you're interested in having our medical support, we can send medical professionals there. And the yeah. medical professionals, once they're done working on that, then they go through... A, a period of quarantine for, let's say, 20 days or 20, 23 days when they're monitored to mm -hmm. make sure that they're safe to come back and not not bring Ebola to the homeland yeah. in, in greater numbers than before. And I also don't think, I disagree with Frieden, it's not about 0%. You know, if the idea is we need to get the Ebola, the, the potential for Ebola to, to show up at all to 0%, well, that's just absurd. But why not make it smaller than what it is right now given given – the openness that we have and, and the procedures that we have in place regarding who comes in and who goes out. Yes, well, and he also said they do have a way of doing it already, but people don't think it's acceptable. But he said, we're doing very good temperature screening. That is where it's going to be the most efficient. That is where they have a few hundred people leaving. We're, we're using appropriate devices, trained staff checking every person who is leaving each of the three countries to see if they have a fever. If you screen people there, instead of a few hundred, it would be a few hundred thousand. It would be inaccurate. And this is, this is the way we think we're going to be the most effective in keeping people who are having a fever from getting on planes. Mm -hmm. So they, they have a way of it. I think I would agree with your, with your statement about it, Jeremiah, if, if we're willing to throw the, throw the boat at it in terms of financial money. Because the question is half-assery. If we half-ass close the border and we half-ass send help, then we're going to get a half-ass of everything and, and Ebola will be everywhere. Could we not? Could we not? Uh, give give more than half ass and and do more than half ass about uh, containment for like for example let me say this um, 
there's a really vague kind of right of return, and this was put by mm -hmm. uh, Andrea Castillo, a Washington, D.C. resident. She said that uh, Frieden steps on shaky ground when his first two contentions invoke, one, a vague right of return uh, for touring foreigners that immediately trumps domestic health, and two, an insulting feigned ignorance of the possibility for aid worker exceptions. And that's what I'm saying. Like, it wouldn't be half-assed to say... Um, we are we are going to have policies regarding uh, non-critical travel, right? That limits non-critical travel uh, from Ebola-stricken countries, and that's once again Andrea Castillo. I like how she phrased that. Um, that we could address that issue of non-critical travel, and that would still allow for exceptions for aid workers. And I don't think that that's half-ass. I think that's that's yeah. that would be a strategic decision or at least is is open to it being a strategic decision I um, think I think denying someone who has a unique strain of Ebola from coming back to America to go to some place like the Mayo Clinic to be tested instead of any nation in Liberia would be an ignorant way to solve it or to deal with it but would they even go to the Mayo Clinic it it depends yeah, it on they, it depends on where they would go in America but the 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 definite answer would be that in Liberia there is no such place that would be able to deal with the most volatile strains of Ebola and so it's going to have to be somebody else. I'm not saying we take the worst people over here every time, but if we start developing a vaccine and we need to test it out, I don't know if we're going to get the right results by sending it over and doing it over in Liberia in not as controlled conditions. Sure. You know, there's well, Rod Dreher at the American Conservative. He was talking about infrastructure. And this is something you and I have talked about before, uh, and yes. I'll just I'll throw it out there and let people kind of uh, gnaw on this. Um, he's quoting a nurse uh, who wrote a, a kind of interesting piece, actually, and, he's, and the nurse says this. So let's look at the infrastructure. There are, in fact, a total of four medical isolation units in the entire United States, as we noted yesterday, that are capable of handling infected Ebola patients near endlessly. He asks, where are they and what can they handle? And these are, these are the four. Emory University's Serious Communicable Disease Unit is in Atlanta, Georgia. Okay, that's where Brantley and, and uh, was it Wright Bowl, where they were treated, mm -hmm. has three beds. St. Yes. Patrick's Hospital ICU Isolation Unit uh, in Missoula has three beds. The National Institute of Health's Special Clinic Studies Unit in Bethesda uh, has seven beds. And the biggest one is the Nebraska Medical Center Biocontaminant Unit uh, in Omaha, Nebraska has ten. So 3 plus 3 plus 7 plus 10 is 23 beds coast to coast, right? That's all, that that's what we ultimately have, which leads to the question, and this was a good question that I think Roger brought up, was, you know, the 360 or 316 million person question is, what happens when we have 24? Mm -hmm. You know, where, where are we going to, where are we going to go? And people can say things like, well, we'll put them in uh, ICU units or ER units or whatever. The problem is, is those units are used for, in many places, hundreds of thousands of people. Yes. I, I think people don't understand how well the CDC can get at not letting it break out. I really don't. I think people are, we're ignorant to it. It's like saying, I know more than a doctor. I, even though I have a broken leg, I've seen it set on TV before. So, I, I mean, no matter what he says, I ultimately, I mean, I don't have to believe him. But he does have trained experience in what he's doing, more than I do. And I mean, I, is that an appeal to authority? Sure. But it's this is from it's it's the government blog, but it's the CDC's direct blog. This is from it's from Health Protection. I don't know who. Uh, it's oh, this is also from this is from Friedman. But just to give an example. Clinicians on the front lines have been key for the safety, identifying patients with both a history of travel and symptoms indicating they might have Ebola, immediately isolating them, consulting their local or state health departments, and getting the patients tested as needed. Indeed, since the outbreak beginning in Africa, CDC has been consulted with the state and local health departments on almost 100 cases in which travelers had recently returned from West Africa and shown symptoms that might have been caused by Ebola. Of those cases, 14 were considered to be truly at risk, Specimens from 13 were tested, and Ebola was ruled out in all 13 cases. But now CDC labs have confirmed our nation's first U.S. diagnosed patient. But basically what he's saying is, there, is, it, is it deadly enough in our first world nation to be closing down the borders? Is the percentage chance of an epidemic high enough 
to close down our borders, which would be a, a reduction in massive amounts of money and GDP for our country to not allow people in and out, even if it's just from West Africa. And could people from West Africa that are wealthy pay for a ticket or travel to another country that we allow them to fly off of and fly into the United States anyways? Or to Canada or somewhere near us would be the question. I think, I think that the entire discussion, um, I think that it, it suffers because of, of the idea that close down the borders. Right, that's that's a big thing. That's like an absolute thing. You you get on a line, <laughs> wherever the line is, uh, and you and you guard it, or you know you build a fence that's going to stop Ebola that's happening right now. And I think that's one thing. But saying okay, you can't do the whole thing. That would be absurd. It's kind of like getting down to zero. Mm -hmm. uh, is is kind of a, an absurd task. But why does it have to be all or nothing? Why can't why can't it be strategic? Why no, can't? But we're talking about I'm saying closing yeah. down to specifically West Africa alone is not a good idea. I'm not talking about closing down Canada's borders and Mexico. No, and, and you're saying a complete. And I would agree if it's a complete shutdown. I would agree if it makes mm -hmm. an exception for for aid workers. I would be more open to that idea. And I I want to say this in 2013. Okay, and I'm I'm quoting from an article here in 2013. Scientists at MIT published research suggesting, quote, that even moderate measures of mobility restriction would be effective in controlling contagion in densely populated areas mm -hmm. with highly interconnected road and transit networks. Mm -hmm. And that's you know, what we're doing right. already by doing temperature gauging and blood tests to people in Liberia who choose to leave. But they're talking about moderate measures of mobility restriction. Well, yeah, okay. Well, that is uh, moderate measure that's of moderate mobility, mobility restriction. Mobility restriction. And I think that's what needs to be argued. That's my point. Uh, yeah, and the same thing is from the same article, CDC research in calmer yeah. times notes that, quote, throughout recorded history, travel has been a major factor in the spread of disease. Uh, and the CDC called for an enhanced, quote, border interventions, end quote, to control outbreaks. So that it's not even foreign to what the CDC has said before. It's not no. foreign to what scientists said just last year at MIT. Um, and And... I'm saying all that only to say this, because I, as I said, I don't have a hard line in the sand. I don't think anybody really should right now. I think mm -hmm. that we're all pretty ignorant about <laughs> Ebola, right? And like, not ignorant about Ebola. We know an awful lot about Ebola. Uh, at the same time, the, the political ramifications of this, because this is political, right? Mm -hmm. it, it really is. When you talk about sure people is. walking around with a disease, uh, people don't typically like that. Um, but I think that I think that what needs to be stressed is that there's there is a reasonable there's a reasonable place here for for disagreement mm -hmm. and for saying I don't I don't fully agree with what the CDC is saying politically about how to deal with this politically or I don't mm -hmm. fully agree with what the White House is saying or I don't fully agree with what Fox News is saying or I don't agree with what Alex Jones and saying we need to be a little calmer here in our thought process Right, sure. get away from the do 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 breaking news. Right, scary yes. images and stuff. Get away, well, turn it off, mm -hmm. and let's talk about this in a serious, calm, rational way, and try and try to figure out if there are if if there are sacrifices, and it would be a sacrifice, sacrifices that we would have to make, even possibly regarding GDP, right, in order to assure that we wouldn't have that kind of a thing, and we can keep on the long haul a long vision. Of, of what we want America to be, not just right now, today, yeah. uh, but next year and, and years after that. Well, and, and I think, too, that it's like what we were saying. The CDC was saying moderate levels of control are needed, and I think by doing temperature gauging and blood testing in Liberia before you can go out, which is what they do right now, I mean, it's not like right now they're saying, oh, you want to go to America? Here's a ticket. You know? They've been doing the, the 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 clinicians and professionals that we've sent there in the first world countries. Majority of their job is to make sure any one coming back to first world nations or leaving the country is cleared. That is that is almost the essential role of what we're going to be doing there. Yeah. And then secondarily would be to try to control it in in the area, which is that's the case. It's number one to stop the outbreak from continuing, and number two is to isolate it. And so I think that. It's a question of what people think the CDC is already doing or not. If they think they are doing nothing or if they think they actually have protocol for what to do with someone who's choosing to go to another country. And 
Yeah, and I, I agree with you. People need to take a step back from it and take a breath and look at it. Do we have to think that the CDC is absolutely right on everything? Oh, no, I don't I don't think they are. You know, and I don't think that, like you said, everybody has a, a version of truth, but I'll take my version of truth with the people that study diseases more than I will with the people that just think they know how to stop a stop it. You know, I have a it's 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 hard too, I guess. It's probably the conservative within me screaming out, right? The suppressed conservative. Uh but but um remembering back on things like Katrina or like FEMA, right? Mm -hmm. Like I mean these are real things and how yeah. uh there's a great deal of of reasonable suspicion regarding uh, government entities and their assurances and what and how good they are at doing it and you said something sure. earlier about the appeal to authority and I I think that and now it's okay in some cases I mean if an authority is a valid authority uh, mm -hmm. and they and they're competent and what they're saying then fine but I think it has more to do with the mistakes I think it rather than how how well we know something like for example the woman that went on the cruise ship uh, mm -hmm. I just that Though it's it's things like that because it's it, you can know all the things in the world, and mm -hmm. you can say, well, we have this, we, we would be able to to deal with this, or this is how we would handle this situation if this happened, um, and then small things like that, hopping on a ship and cruising around for a while, and mm -hmm. having Ebola uh, <laughs> on yeah. the boat, yeah, um, you know, or flying on a plane oh, uh, and yeah. going to a different state, like those those are mistakes. Mm -hmm. Those are things that the CDC has learned from, but at the same time. What it's, what it's demonstrated is that mistakes are bound to happen. And the question is, what can happen in light of a mistake? I agree with that. I would say, by that logic, I wouldn't give the government more authority by letting them have more control over the situation and closing it down if we know that they're not capable of it. Right. So I, I, that's why I don't think they would be able to functionally close down a border even if they attempted to. It would be a waste right. of resources. Which that, that applies to that argument in response to conservatives is to say, listen, if you if you criticize the government, it's an awfully strange thing that all of a sudden you think that this this government project is gonna work. Is gonna work. Uh, yes. <laughs> hey, yeah. like, That's so, okay. the libertarian in me that says I don't know right. if I trust them enough to let them have the authority to close down the border. Right, right. I'm with you. Okay, very well, dude. This was this was a lot of fun today. And uh, I, I wanna apologize to everybody again for being really late, but let me let me tell you this. Okay, and I'm going to make a pitch here. Paleo Radio, we have a vision, and that vision includes, in, the, in what we hope to be the near future, WKTV. WKTV here in Grand Rapids, Michigan, amazing place. Top-of-the-line equipment, top-of-the-line studio, top-of-the-line overall facility, right? Yeah. It, is, it, is, it is an awesome, awesome place, and uh, we're, we're hoping within the very near future to start recording our shows right there. And we want to invite people who enjoy watching Paleo Radio, enjoy listening to Paleo Radio, uh, and would love to be involved to, to get involved and to contact us. Actually, you can do it right here. It's on the screen, jeremiah.bannister at gmail.com. And you can find out more. We've already gotten, oh, boy, we, it, there's a requirement. I'll, and you know, I'll say this. There's a requirement at the station that for programs that are recorded there that, they ha that you have three volunteers uh, that are working behind the scenes of what's going on. And so uh, the volunteers, of course, would be trained and certified in the equipment. In the studio, you would learn to deal with lighting and video and editing and all cool software and all that kind of stuff. Um, and right now, we have nine. Mm -hmm. Nine people, including you and I. Uh, we have nine people, and I had the, the opportunity to, uh, to meet uh, the newest one, Nick, I had the opportunity to meet him, and what, what is so cool about this, and this is what I want to encourage people uh, with this, is that as it stands right now, right, we, we uh, got the lucky end of the bargain because the people who have, have been interested in working with us are people who have gone to school for, for media, for communication, for mass communication, for philosophy, for graphic design, for computers, um, people who have volunteered and worked uh, in, in these different fields. Uh, and so we've got a really good team so far. But I don't want that to be disheartening to people who may not have gone to school, people who may not have ever done this before. There's a first time for everything, okay? And it would be a great first 
for anyone wanting to get involved in this kind of a project to get involved with what we're doing uh, in our ambitions to get on WKTV. So I encourage you, email us, jeremiah.bannister at gmail.com. Um, say something real quick, dude, about Southpaws, because you actually have two shows this week. You have two shows every week. you got two shows this week, and then you've got the live election event. I want you to say that and talk about that again, because that's exciting. Yeah, so um, Southpaws originally it will air on Tuesdays and Wednesdays from 10 a.m. to noon Eastern Standard Time, and they also do uh, replays on uh, Wednesday night and Thursday mornings from 12 a.m. to uh, 2 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And you can also download our old shows on uh, www.publicrealityradio.org and just click on Southpaws, and it has all of our old shows archived. But what's really fun that's coming up is November 4th we're going to be uh, having our own um, election uh, show where we're just going to cover the elections and go over uh, who takes what seats and who's in control of, hopefully we can have a switch of who's in control of the House, specifically in Michigan, and we can see uh, what's going on in politics. So November 4th from uh, 8 to 11 we're going to be on 95.3 FM, 1680 AM, or streaming live at publicrealityradio.org on November 4th. So, uh, yeah, tune in. It's going to be a lot of fun. And and you get you would hear Joe in his natural element of the radio. Cause that's, that's right. We're not, we're, our natural element is not Google Hangouts. Like, no, I, not, say, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a faster swimming fish in the waters of radio. Oh, yeah, same here. I mean, yeah, it's, it's what we've done for so long. Uh, I'll say this. This is the last announcement, and then we'll head out, friends. Um, on November 21st, I am going to be do, uh, presenting my very first lecture for a secular student alliance organization at a school, and I'm not going to say where it is, but I yet, um, but it's been settled the date. So November 21st, I'm going to be uh, presenting on on this on the topic that I lectured on for atheist analysis on whether or not ex Christians were ever real Christians and why that's a really important issue. Uh, interpersonally, counter-apologetically, politically, culturally, you name it. Uh, and I might even be doing some question and answer about last year's uh, nativity scene controversy in Door, Michigan. So I'm super excited about that. And if you are part of a group or an organization, uh, including student organizations on university cam uh, universities and colleges and, and high school campuses around the country, uh, we encourage you, contact us. If you would like to have Joe and I speak individually or together, uh, contact us. Uh, you can contact us at jeremiah.bannister at gmail.com. Uh, you can also contact Joe at hojotees, H-O-J-O-T-E-E-S, hojotees at gmail.com. And, right. uh, and you can contact him, and, and we can set up uh, interviews and presentations and uh, maybe even debates, whatever whatever we're in for. We're up, we're up right. for at least the pitch, right? Mm. Right, for sure. No, that would be great. I'm I'm very interested in doing public speaking and debate. So if uh, if we got a call, I'm sure we would answer it. Very good. Well, my friend, it was a great time as always. I absolutely love spending time with you and talking about these issues. And I love the iron iron sharpening iron, dude. Is, is that's right? What this is about, and I, I absolutely love it. Uh, you're a great friend. You're you're a brilliant host. And uh, thank you, thank you for. Uh, being on the show today. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate it, man. It's, yeah. it's, it's a lot of fun. I think we have a lot of good things ahead of us. Paleo Radio, subscribe. Subscribe, subscribe, like, comment, share, you name it, all of that stuff. So thank you very much, my friends. Right. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. thank you, all of our friends and fans. And make sure to follow us on Facebook so that you can find out when we're actually going to be on the air. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it changes all the time. So make sure to find yes, us on, on Facebook. At Paleo Radio. Thanks so much. All right. Thank Get you. Get everyone right with love. We'll see you again next week. Bye.